Tonight we're going to talk about raising our eyes to heaven, and I'm going to ask you a question and let you think about it. Oh, there's my illustration. So I want you to think about the most arrogant, self-centered person that you know. How many of you work with someone who's really arrogant? How many of you are married? No, don't do that. You're in big trouble. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't admit it. I had a teenager raise their hand. I'm not sure what that means. Hmm. So I was thinking about different things that will freak you out. When I was a kid, my brother and I asked my dad to build us a tree fort. And my dad was a contractor. And uh, he kept saying he'd get around to it, he'd get around to it. So one day my brother and I said, you know what? We'll just do it. And so um, where we were going to do it, there were some palmetto bushes. And so I got a, uh, a big old um, machete. And my brother got an axe. And of course, we're hillbillies, so we were barefoot. And we're walking out where we're going to start building this tree fort. We were probably like 10 years old. And so we're headed out. My brother's nine. And my dad owned a construction company, so, you know, power tools. We, we, we're lucky we have fingers. And so um, my uncle didn't, but that's another story. Anyway, so, um, so we're walking out there, and my dad had just sharpened his axe. And it caught between my brother's toes. And I'll never forget, I'm the older brother, so I'm like, no, no, we'll just put a Band-Aid on it. And there's just blood everywhere. So ever since then, I will tell you that I'm very careful around pickaxes and axes. And I will tell you that I would never talk to you face-to-face -face with an axe or a knife in my hand. I just won't because I, I'm too clumsy. And... So, and I'm worried about falling off the stage and carry, you know, taking this. But, but the truth is, when you're around somebody who's prideful, when you're around somebody who's arrogant, it's like talking to somebody that has something sharp in their hand, and they're talking to you and waving it around. It's like, I, I don't really want to be around you. And pride is one of these things that is so easy to see in other people and so hard and difficult to see in ourselves. It's so easy to see when other people are prideful and to think, wow, that person's really prideful. And we're even prideful about that, which is crazy. Um, I saw a quote by Mark Twain this morning that I thought was really good. Um, so I'm going to read it to you. Temper is what gets most of us into trouble. That's a good statement. But pride is what keeps us there. And so... Uh, you know, this whole idea, as we're looking at the book of Daniel, we see Daniel go through, Daniel goes through uh, several, actually three different uh, kings that, that, that are in charge. And in this one, uh, this king that he's already dealt with and talked to that likes him, and you remember all that stuff, uh, this king uh, has a dream. And uh, much like that dream, but a negative one, and it's a little bit scary so this time, the king actually brings Daniel in, and instead of threatening to kill him, he tells him what his dream is and says, tell me what it means, and that's where we pick up. So today, we're going to talk about pride and humility, and I'm going to give you two points about pride and then the importance of humility, and I'm going to give you today just some practical ways that you can deal with, because listen, listen, I don't care who you are, we all deal with pride. We, we all deal with, I'm a little better then you are at this, or, or boy, you're just a dummy, you know, or whatever we think in our heads that makes us think we're better than someone else. And so we're going to, number one, pride blinds us to the needs of others. So here we go. Daniel goes to him and says, this is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. This is what Daniel tells him. He says, you're going to be driven away from people. You're going to live with wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Not the nicest thing to say to a king. And then he continues. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. By the way, they found a document by Nebuchadnezzar that says that he was given his kingdom by the gods. And I just think that's so neat that it's here. Daniel tells him that. Now, he may have not 
fully understood the Jewish gods. He may have not understood the Jewish God. He may have not understood that, but he understood that God put him in the place, and it's because of this story. Anyway, it continues. And gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. So Daniel says, Les, let me give you a little advice. This dream is terrible, but let me tell you what you need to do. And then he says this. Renounce your sins. How am I going to renounce them? By doing what is right and your wickedness. And then how do I do that? Here's what he says. By being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Daniel looks at the king and says, listen, if you want to overcome this pride, if you want to overcome this sin in your life, be kind to the oppressed. So I want to tell you a couple things that I realize. Um, did you hear about the bus driver that got bit by a snake this week? Did you hear about that one? And he grabbed the snake and took it to the hospital, and they were able to give him the anti-venom so he didn't die. He had to see what the venom was so they could give him anti-venom. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so that's what they have to do for a snake. Pride is the same way. We have to discover what is the antidote. Because the truth is, listen, on this earth, I don't care how long you've been a Christian. Our world, the world we live in, has selfish gravity. And even though you love God, and even though you want to do what God says, there's a selfish gravity, as long as you're not in heaven, that's going to pull you towards self-centeredness, selfishness. And so you need the antidote, which of course is Christ. We know that that's the antidote. But the truth is, the real antidote is learning to serve other people and to give. Giving is the antidote to our selfishness and self-centeredness. Because the truth is, we typically think about us, we think about our needs, we think about our wants, we think about our desires, we think about what we can do. And giving in the right way to the oppressed, to the people that are hurting. Now listen, listen. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not talking about enabling somebody. You codependents in this room need to hear me. Don't give because you feel guilty. Don't give because somebody's manipulating you. But when you give because you see a need, and when you serve because you see a need, that's the antidote to the selfishness and self-centeredness we have. The truth is, if we don't give, we just become more selfish. If we don't serve, we just become more selfish. I can tell you from experience taking junior hires, seventh and eighth graders on mission trips. I had more parents call me and say, I don't know what you did to them, but they are saying thank you. <laughs> and I have learned that it not only matters for kids, but it matters for adults. And so I want to encourage you to look at your life and look, do you actually give? Do you make it a priority? I'm not saying being manipulated. I'm not saying when somebody comes in and cries and begs for money. I will never do that. And I don't know what anyone in our church gives. And I like it that way. But can I tell you that God notices what you give? How do I know that? Because of this verse. Let me read it to you. This is really cool because this guy, Cornelius, was not even Jewish. But he prayed and he gave so much so that God noticed and sent an angel to his house. Hey, if you give enough that God sends an angel to your house, that would be really cool. Not only that, he's the first non-Jewish believer that we know about that the gospel was brought to. And so how did it start? Let's read what the angel says. Cornelius stared at him in fear, which is a good start for angels. By the way, Angels in the Bible, when they appeared to people, always said these words, do not fear. You know why? Because they're not little babies with wings. <laughs> when, you, when you see an angel, it's going to be like, oh. The only time is, is, is the donkey guy. The, the only time is when an angel appeared to Balaam. He didn't tell him not to be afraid. Why? Because he wanted him to be afraid. 
And so he appears, Cornelius is freaked out, and it says, what is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered. Listen to this. This is what God noticed. Your prayer, so praying for people, lifting people up, looking for those who are hurting, and praying that God would help them. And, and some people, some theologians believe that this word for prayer means that he opened up a place for people to pray. But then it says, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. So your pastor has no idea what you give. And I tell you that all the time. And I've gotten people mad at me because sometimes I say, I don't care what you give. And they go, don't say that. My mom loves to tell me, don't tell them you don't care. She's watching today online. I do care. But I don't know what you give. And I've had pastors tell me, you should know what your congregation gives. No, I don't want to know. But God knows. Now, I will tell you one thing that we do, if you're going to be in leadership at our church, if you're going to be on a budget team or you're going to be on an advisory team, we give all the names to our financial person first and we say, listen, if they don't give to our church, they should not be in leadership, so take their names out. And so, no one that doesn't give, and you wouldn't want somebody who doesn't give to be in leadership. You wouldn't want somebody who doesn't give to be a part of deciding what you give, where it goes. That would be like being a congressman. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, they can't even get the time change thing done. When they get that time change thing done, I'll be like, oh, they accomplished something. Sorry, okay. <clears throat> so serve, and it'll defeat your selfish pride. If you're struggling with serving, then I would say, hey, begin to serve anyway. But hey, Can I tell you the truth? I, I'm also a, a part of Rotary, and Rotary has things early Saturday morning when I don't want to give up, get up, or give up, either one. And I cannot tell you how many times they've had something on Saturday when 7 o'clock in the morning I'm waking up, I'm looking at my clock and going, I don't want to go. And sometimes Kristen goes, that's why you should go. I've never had a time that I woke up on a Saturday morning at 7 in the morning and went, woohoo, picking up at the park, woohoo. No, I go, oh. All the way there, I go, oh, oh. Actually, that's me on the way to church. No, oh, wait, no, that's you on the way to church, not me. All right. Exactly. One of the things you have to understand is your flesh does not want to help anyone. And so you've got to fight your flesh. Now, I'm not talking about being manipulated by people. I'm not talking about feeling guilty for the guy with the sign. I'm talking about going over here to the sharing center and packing a couple boxes for them. I'm talking about going through your closet and picking some clothes and saying, you know what, I'm going to donate those, that's those to this group. I'm talking about you looking at your finances and going, I'm going to dedicate this amount every month to give to charity. Not because I feel guilty, not because I feel manipulated, but because I'm giving because that's what God wants me to do. Why does God want me to do it? Because it gets us away from that selfishness that pulls us down all the time. Number two, pride leads us to low places. And I know you might have some friends in low places. But pride leads us to low places. Years ago, I visited a huge church. I mean, this church had tens of thousands of people. And one of the really cool things was we got to meet with one staff member who was over one ministry in the church, and we got to ask them anything we wanted. And that was the best, because we went to this big conference, and in the conference they said, we do this, we do this, we do this. And we were like, wow. So we said to the guy, how do you do that? And he goes, we don't always do that. I'm like, this is the best conference I've ever been to. Because the big guys on the stage would be like, that's what we always do. And then I'd talk to the staff and they'd go, not really. No, that's not how it works. But the coolest thing he told us was how they hire staff at their church. What they do is they bring the staff in for interview and they would take them to an overnight rustic camp. And they would go to this camp and one of the things they had at this camp, I don't even know how they got this, they had a wood 
fired hot water heater. I don't even know where you find that or get that. And so they have this wood-fired hot water heater, and what they would do is they'd bring that staff member and watch. Did they just use the wood, or did they chop some more wood? Did they just take everything for themselves? How did they treat other people that weekend? Did they serve other people and go out of their way to do that, or was it only for them? I've heard of Fortune 500 CEOs who, at interviews, will take someone to dinner. Well, that's pretty normal, Eric. Yeah, yeah. But before they get there, by the way, I would love to do this. Before they get there, they go to the waiter or waitress and they say, listen, I'm going to be coming in later and I'm going to tip you really well. But I need you to give me terrible service. I need you to mess up everything. And so they bring the person in, they sit them down, they're eating, they'll bring them the wrong food, they'll spill a drink, and what they do is they watch how the person reacts. Number one, will the person freak out and treat the person like they're not important and they don't matter? Because they know that's how they'll treat people in the company. Or will they not say anything and eat fish instead of steak and ignore it? That's not good either. So they watch what they do to see, are they going to be prideful? Are they going to be arrogant in how they treat others? And you know what I think and really believe? I believe that God does the same thing. Why? Because watch what happens here. The story continues. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of royal palace. By the way, if you haven't learned anything from scripture, when you see David and you see King Nebuchadnezzar, you can realize that walking on a roof is not a good idea. I'm just saying. All right, so, now you know. The police think walking on the moon's not good. All right, so, twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, now listen to this, is not this the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what's decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You'll be driven away from people and serve with wild animals. You'll eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, and he gives them to anyone he wishes. Basically, are you going to acknowledge that God is in charge? I heard a pastor years ago say, every marriage that's in trouble is in trouble because of pride. And every couple thinks it's the other person's pride. He brings them in and says, you know, your problem in your marriage is pride. And they go, that's exactly what he needs to hear. Or, that's exactly what she needs to hear. And they're pointing at the other one saying, yes, if they weren't prideful, you're right. Because that's how we are. We tend to see pride in others, but not in ourselves. We tend to think we're entitled. We tend to think people owe us things. In James 4, 6, it says this. He gives us more grace. By the way, we should be thankful that God gives us grace. You know what that means? It means you don't have it all together. Have you figured that out yet? <laughs> if you haven't figured it out yet, ask somebody who knows you. <laughs> I have people who will give you a list of mine if you need some help. We got, my brother's been keeping a list for 30 years. All right, here we go. And then it says, that is what Scripture says. God opposes the proud. Do you really want to be against God? I mean, we've been watching football. Can you imagine if you're on the offensive line and suddenly you look up and it's God? You can have the quarterback. That's fine. Right? He opposes the proud, but listen to the way it is. He shows favor to the humble. What does that mean? When you recognize that you're not better than that other person. Listen. You might be better at doing something than another person that doesn't make you better than them. When you go to another country to serve in ministry, just because you have more money doesn't mean you're better than those other people. And the truth is, in God's eyes, they may be, the way they're treating their family and the way they're treating those, they may be superior to you. And yet Americans are notorious for going to other countries and thinking we're better than the other people. You're not better than, you're just different than. And maybe you do something better, but it doesn't mean you do everything better. 
Just because they leave their socks on the floor does not mean they're the biggest idiot. I mean, they might be the biggest idiot, but not because they leave their socks on the floor, right? Be careful what you focus on. I love this quote. The Christian gospel is that I'm so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I'm so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to deep humility, but also deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both, I love this, swaggering and sniveling. You don't have to be Charlie Brown, and you don't have to be Lucy. Right? You don't think you're better than everybody, and you move the football, and you also aren't like, everything's wrong. Because you understand how he loves you. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I don't think more of myself or less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. You can't serve other people when you're only thinking of you. You might be able to do some things, but the truth is if you really want to serve people, you have to love the people that you serve. And you can't be arrogant and love people at the same time. Number three, humility before God can restore us. When I worked at Quincy's years ago, I know you're hearing another Quincy story. Some of the best stories came from Quincy's. This lady came to Quincy's who was like a phenomenal server. Like she was really good. And I said, wow, you're a really good server. And she goes, yeah, yeah, I got fired at my last job. And I went, whoa, 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 where'd you work before? And she named the most expensive restaurant in town. And I thought, what in the world did you do? And why would you leave there? She said, well, one night I was serving this huge group of executives. There were like 50 of them. And I was by myself serving. She said, I worked harder than I've ever worked. I did more than I've ever done. They were so needy and needed more and more. And I kept going back and going back and going back. And they went to leave. And as they went to leave, I looked around the table and realized they did not leave me a dime. On the table, there was one dollar on the table. That's all that was there. She said, I was furious. And I grabbed that dollar. And I ran up to the executive. And I crumbled it up. And I said, just keep it. And the boss came out and said, uh, this is going to be your last night here, and you need to clean up that table before you leave. And as she went to clean up the table, she picked up the first plate, and there was a $20 bill under it. She went around to all 50 places, and under each one were 5 and 10s and 20s and 50s, the biggest tip she ever got. But it was too late. Her pride had gotten to her, she thought. She knew what was going on, but she didn't. Can I tell you something about you and about me? We don't know what other people are dealing with. We, we don't know what other people are struggling with. That jerk that you know, don't look at him. A couple of spouses went, don't do that. That jerk that you know, you don't know what they're dealing with. That neighbor that you have that's struggling, you don't know what they're dealing with. And so realize, yes, what they do in this area is terrible, but it doesn't mean, listen, doesn't mean you're better than they are. I'm not saying you have to justify what they're doing, but it doesn't mean you are better than them. You see the difference? Listen to what happens next. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. That's the most important thing we can do. Because when you raise your eyes to heaven, you realize how much God loves you and how much he loves them. I raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was proud of his kingdom, and then he realized, my kingdom's nothing compared to God's. Then a few verses later, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven. Why? Because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. Have you had those humbling moments in life? Have you learned from those humbling moments of life? See, so what happens to us, we go through these things in life that humble us, and we recognize, God, without you, I can't do it. But then over time, we start to kind of get back on our feet, and we start to think, you know, I can't believe that person's struggling. I would never struggle that way. But we'll struggle some way. And we need God's help and we need God's guidance. 
One of the things I recognize is you can't improve until you know that you fail. One of the reasons I love overcomers groups and I love groups like AA is because in those groups, as they go around to the different people, the different people say, I'm so-and-so and this is what I struggle with or I'm a whatever. And they go around the group. Why? To admit this is where I'm at. And you can't get to where God wants you until you know where you're at. You can't work on the problems in your life until you recognize what your problems are. It is much easier to look at other people's problems. It is much easier to talk about other people's difficulties. But the truth is, we need to every day say to God, God, is there any area of my life? Is there any speck of sin? Is there any log of sin in my life? Is there any error in my life that I need to deal with? That's called confession. And we all need that time of confession. One of the reasons I love the Acts Prayer, A-C-T-S, is because every day it helps you, A, adore, recognize how good God is, take time to adore Him. That's A. C, confession. Is there any pride in your life? Is there any arrogance in your life? Is there any area where you're messed up? Confession. Three, thanksgiving. To recognize how good God's been to you. When's the last time you just took time to be thankful? For some of you, if you just took time every day to be thankful, two things would happen. Number one, you'd become grateful. But number two, you'd be humbled because you'd recognize how good God has been to you. And then finally, S is for supplication, which is a big word for praying for yourself and praying for other people. And so ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. If you'll take time to do that, what will happen? You'll recognize the power of God in your life, and it will be an antidote to that selfish gravity. You'll look for ways to be a blessing to other people. In James 4.10, it says this, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Years ago, Rodney Walker was here at our church, and he came up to me and he said, Eric, what's one way I can help here? What do you, what do you need help with? And I said, Rodney, um, I need some chairs set up. And I said, okay. He set up chairs. A few weeks later, he came to me and said, Eric, what's some more stuff I can help? I don't mind help with chairs, but I can help with other stuff. How can I help? And I said, you know what would really help? I said, it would really help us if you led a small group. Could you lead a small group? So they opened their home, started leading a small group. Literally for years, every time he came to me, he said, what, what do you need me to do to help? And he literally, anything I would say, he would do. I said, can you go visit the hospital because I don't have time to go see this person. Can you go see him? He's like, okay. Wasn't it too many years before Rodney said, I, I really feel like God's calling me into ministry. I want to be ordained. So we were able to be a part of that ordination ceremony. And then Rodney said the words that I told him, you didn't need to do that. And he said, this church has called me, and I feel like God has called me to be the pastor at First Baptist Rockledge. And he left and went there. And I said, you were a saint, now you're a sinner. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, I said, God led you exactly where you needed to go. One of the things I've learned over the years, I've been a pastor a long time. And one of the things I've learned is, just like the parable of the talents, you give people a little bit of responsibility and watch what they do with it. Everybody wants to be up front, but very few people want to serve and wash feet. But you wash how people, watch how people wash feet, and then you start to trust them to do more and more. God's still using him today. I've had a lot of interns in my life that are full-time pastors now. And I watch how God started them off by just serving, and now God's using them. Listen, if you want God to use you, don't try to start at the top. Ask God, just use me where I'm at. God, use me at my workplace. God, use me in my neighborhood. God, use me as I get to know people to be a blessing and say, God, humble me and use me where I'm at and look for ways to serve and ways to give. When you find yourself being arrogant, you'll know it. People won't want to be around you. When you're swinging an axe, people like to give you space. So if you're like, that would happen in my marriage. But we all get that way sometimes. So just take time to humble yourself before God. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender. That's the main word in the Christian life. Surrender your life to Jesus, knowing he died for you 
and rose again, so that when you take all your burdens, all your problems, all your sins, and lay it before your feet, his feet, and you say, Jesus, I want to follow you, whatever that means. You just humble yourself before him. Maybe you're here today, and as I talked about pride, you went, oh, oh. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. He convicts us of sin, and that's okay. And you confess it to him, and the Bible says he takes care of it. So if you need to do that, feel free to do that today. We're going to have our time of prayer and then our time of giving. Remember, that's that unselfish act. That's the antidote to all of our selfishness. So I encourage you to give today with the right heart. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us so much. Lord, I pray we could humble ourselves, recognizing that all good things come from you. And we're thankful and grateful today. In Jesus' name, amen.